what 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 a world we live in where there may actually be aliens and we're not even talking about it <laughs> all right we're rolling what's up <laughs> I'm excited to have you on for a number of reasons. One is you're just always a fun guy to talk to, and we don't talk that often. I, you know, I, I, I see you at industry events. I don't go to as many as you do. Since we started the, the technology company, since we tar- started the software, we've been laying low a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, but I was thinking about the last time I saw you and the fact that I have to think about when that's going to happen again, because we're not doing conferences right now. We're, 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 we're not getting together with, with people. I, I'm, you know, we'll talk about it here in a second. I'm, I'm going to hope that a lot of people that listen to this already know who you are and know a little bit about the, the Knowledge Coop. Obviously, you provide compliance and regulatory plus, plus, plus training to the industry. Um, how is it right now? So, I mean, you, you, you've been a guy that's put out some great production over the years. Has it been an, a, an easy switch to just do everything online and remote because you were already doing it and building the library? Do you miss getting in front of people? What does the calendar look like? Like, talk to me. You know, it's interesting. I think if you look at our business model, I should be super thrilled right now. Like it is, I mean, we're, we were poised for this. We were, we were built for this. Our technology thrives in times like this. Uh, Personally, I hate that. Like that that's the future. Not, not that that's the future, but that um, I hate not being out there speaking. And so uh, the industry is, uh, you know, everybody's working out of their houses. Our technology allows people to work out of their house better and allows people to communicate and train their people better. And so it's really, really good for us that, that we're getting the, the feel for everybody using the software the way it was built to, to be used. But we started canceling live gigs right at the beginning of this. And it, dude, I crashed hard. Like it was very difficult for me. I love adventure. I'm a seven on the Enneagram. So I am all about the next adventure. And I had a hard time not adventuring. And for me, like I would schedule a trip. I'm going to go speak to like, we had our biggest event of the year, um, live event. We speak to 360 people. I think we're signed up uh, for a caliber um, this Mm -hmm. year. I've been doing that gig for like 12 years since the NMLS started. And so that is just a perfect example of, like I plan for that thing. It's my moment every year. Like it's stand up comedy for eight hours and it's a CE class, but I've been training them for so long. We have a connection. And so for me, that was like, oh dang, that's part of my adventure is being crushed. And now they're going to do online CE with us, which is awesome. So we're still getting that business. Right. But for me, it's not just about the business. It's about this full adventure that I'm living of creating a technology people can enjoy while also getting out there and speaking and having the relationships and dude, a beer with you is like, that's what I do, right? That's my world is going out and having beer and golfing and, and, you know, enjoying a learning at a conference and networking. And those are dead right now, like just those experiences. So it's definitely been weird. One of the things that's been interesting to me through this and curious to get your take, because you have a lot of young staff on your team. Um, and, and it's always been like that. We, yeah. we, we do as well. And so here in North Carolina, we were ahead of the governor's order and we went remote, I don't know, seven, eight weeks ago. And then we've been back for over two weeks now. Mm-hmm. And when we went remote, you know, same with us, our software is designed in such a way where we don't need to sit next to each other. We don't need to be in the same office. Really from a productivity perspective, nothing should change. Well, it did change, and I'm sure it's changed for everybody. Yeah. But the people that had the hardest time with it were my youngest employees. It was the 22-year-olds and the 23-year-olds and the 28-year-olds that it, everything you read tells you it should be the opposite. They, they want it. They have no problem with it. I was getting emails from them saying, can I come back to work now? Right. When, when, when I couldn't open up the office yet. Right. Well, I, I think it's more, I think it's more introvert extrovert than it is age thing in my, in my experience, um, because my extroverts are dying. And so I, getting them in is great. I have introverts that are younger that are just doing great. They're like, you no, know. um, but that's also a, it's an age group that hasn't been told no a ton. And so having, you know, being grounded for some of them, this might be the first time they were grounded. 
where you and I grew up being grounded for a week and no video games, no TV. And uh, it's- I, I figured out how to open up the window so I can sneak out for a few hours. <laughs> me too. Right? <laughs> My daughter just came to me. She's like, hey, can I sneak out? I'm like, why would you ask me that? I'm like, of course you can, because you asked. But like- Isn't that great? They have to ask permission to break the rules. <laughs> totally. We don't have nearly the same rules. People don't, like, I don't, I wonder if, how much kids say, have that experience of when you come home and you did something wrong and mom says, wait till your dad gets home. And then you're in, you're in your room on lockdown, not yeah. looking at a phone, not playing at a video game. The only thing you're thinking about is when those headlights come up the driveway and you can yeah. see them and your heart rate goes through the roof and your blood pressure starts to go bonkers because yeah. dad's coming down the hallway. Right. I don't think any, I don't think my kids would be scared of that. They'd be like, Oh cool. Dad's coming home. Video games. Like that's right. I'll <laughs> waste some time until dad gets home. It's a totally different world. I, I had the same thing. My mom was, you know, my mom's awesome and powerful. And yet when she said, you just wait till your dad, I don't know what we're going to do. Wait till dad gets home. It was definitely, and we didn't have video games as much as we had GI Joe figures and WrestleMania figures. So I'd be in there, you know, on, on timeout, just going crazy. But now, I mean, the technology, one side note on that, we're doing premarital counseling for a couple. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's fun to like go back to, we've been married almost 25 years. And so talking to them, but uh, it's fun. But, but when we talk to them, it's like, they are dealing with devices that we never dealt with. Like growing up, you know, when we got married, we didn't have a TV. And when well, we had a TV, it was about that big. Um, couldn't afford anything and didn't have cable. And so we hung out with each other. And now you're talking about a generation that is always doing this. Right. And it's like, how do you coach a young couple on cementing your marriage in those first few years while you're doing this all the time? Like, it's, it's different distractions. You know, one of the reasons why this podcast is called The Walk is th there, there's been two experiences in my life where there were conversations that solved problems for me. And I could look back and say, I didn't know that that was solving a problem at the time, but now I realize it was. One of them, and, and these were problems of a sixth grader. So whatever those problems were, but I had this, this buddy that at lunch, when lunch was over, you were allowed to go walk over to the playground or football field or whatever it was. And there was this hill and he, he, as a joke, after lunch, he'd come up to me, tap me on the shoulder and say, Hey, do you want to go for a walk and talk about old times? Now we were in sixth grade, so there weren't <laughs> a lot of old times yet, but he was yeah. a funny kid. And we would just talk about girls and school and sports and parents and um, you didn't realize it, but you were solving a lot of problems in that moment, just going for a walk and talking with your buddy. The other time was when my wife and I decided that we were definitely in love and we thought we wanted to spend the rest of our lives together, but we had some religious differences. We had some geographic differences at the time, and we went for a walk for three hours and we talked about everything. And I think that's kind of what you're describing is mm -hmm. that those conversations don't happen quite as often because the brain's been wired to maybe only be able to handle little bits and pieces while there's lots of other distractions. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That dude, the walk is for me, that's, that's where everything gets done. My wife and I walk pretty consistently. Uh, we have a lake we walk around and wow. three laps is four miles. And so we'll do our walk. And uh, I was just talking about that actually in, in the premarital counseling we we're doing yesterday having touch points where like, this is our connection time. And that walk for us is like, that's when the connection begins. Now it sucks because that's also where we argue. So, uh, because that's when you, when I'm traveling a bunch and I fly back into town, like we'll go for a walk right away just to go work through, we call it the landing. Mm -hmm. So how do I land better? Um, and it's been really successful for us to go spend that time walking, but it's also, we call it moments of intense fellowship. It's also where we have, you know, we deal with stuff. Like we put it all out there and it's a pretty empty walk, especially right now. Like as far as there's not a lot of people on the trails, right. but it really is like, you've got to have those touch points where it's like, I know we're going to deal with stuff on the trail and then we're going to go back home and be able to be the parents we're supposed to be because we dealt with things on the trail. Um, but that walk is, dude, it's, it's off. And I think part of it is we're not looking at each other. And so we're looking straight ahead. And so there's not the pressure of, staring at somebody across the table it's more like you can think more and nature dude you're surrounded by nature and it's beautiful so there's some of that well i guess nature becomes the therapist in a way like you have okay. an and you have the arbitrator you have the mediator that that i never thought about that that you're you're not making eye contact a lot of the time 
-hmm. How do you replicate that with your team? So when there's problems that need to be solved or sometimes challenges that you don't even know you have, you, you figure them out when you go for the walk. Are there ways that you found work for you with the team on the business side? Yeah, we walk. Really? <laughs> Yeah, we always walk, dude. We do laps around this block like crazy. We're about to move offices, uh, and our new ones got crazy good walk uh, around it. So you can walk along the river, and but we do. We just grab each other and go, "Hey, let's head out," and we just walk out the door and just start walking. So it's that's a really good way to to grow. Okay, so sticking on so, sort of this this topic of how your, people's brains are functioning um, today versus back in the day. You you started off um, in the business originating right and, and and i recall from past conversations i mean you were a, a really good originator um yeah. you're also a thinker and a studier and someone who felt like um for, for me to be really good at this i need to know all the guidelines backwards and forwards i, I don't want to miss anything with technology today have we created an originator that does it have that same wiring because they don't need to? I'm really curious to hear what you find when you train and when you coach um, and what the originator looks like today, maybe, maybe compared to what you look like when you were getting started as an originator. Has technology really helped us 100% or is it also hurting us a little bit because we're not able to use our brains to think through those scenarios? That's a great question. I don't think it's, I don't think it's hurt us that much. I mean, the technology isn't much different as much as we should be different. The new tech is cool and it's a lot better, but I mean, we had a POS back then. We had, um, we, we processed through uh, L, uh, what was it called? Uh, LP, LP, oh. LPDU. I don't know. It was, uh, anyway, we had a processing system we were using back then. And uh, oh, it was Ellie Mays. Maybe. Okay. Anyway. No, yeah. it only made them exist. So when I started in 1998, we had point oh. and then we had a processing system that we'd send stuff through, but it was still about the interaction with the consumer or with the uh, consumer that you wanted to do a loan with you. And so um, there's a lot of that. And there was also a lot of brainstorming with people. I think technology that's changed the mortgage industry is more the social media side of the industry where it's easier to get leads. You know, we couldn't get leads by jumping on Facebook. I had to go, you know, talk to people. We had to get in front of people. We had to pick up the phone and call people. I called when I first started in September of 98, I was fresh out of college and I started just calling. They gave me a, a it was a, in our software, if somebody didn't get a call back from somebody for like three times, they could just basically throw in the trash. Mm -hmm. I dug through everybody's trash and just called people saying, still want a loan, still want a loan, still want a loan. And I didn't have any experience in the mortgage industry. I didn't know the T was silent in mortgage. Like I didn't know anything. I had, I had rented, but that's it. And so that's how I started it. And I don't know that we've changed much since then. I mean, training's a little different. Casey's doing a great job at Phoenix. You know, we launched in 2003, I launched this company. So 17 years ago um, to train new loan officers to get into the business, but still it's, the fact that I can name the one company that's actually doing training in America for new loan officers is a problem. Like we're just not, uh, my son's graduating, we're well, not graduating college. He's Corona out of college for now. Right. Uh, where he had the first year in college and now he's gonna take this year off. And I'm like, dude, mortgage industry. Uh, and I don't know that we've gotten good yet at bringing people into the mortgage industry the right way, because I think there should be a better way to launch loan officers into the world uh, or processes or underwriters. I mean, the underwriting generation is still an older generation and we need to bring them in differently. So I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to make us different than when we were, where we were in 1998. You think the reason for that on the originator side is that it doesn't fit the economic model of most companies. They just haven't, they haven't created a, 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 a place for it in the overall company P and L. Dude, it's so smart though, if they were to do it, because the overall PL, imagine a loan officer that doesn't demand X amount of BIPs, a parking space, and Lakers tickets. Like, <laughs> there's, there's a next generation of loan officer that demands a lot less. And it's me when I was a kid. You know, when I right. got in, they, it was a $30,000 base. And I was like, what? $30,000? I was like, so pumped. And then they're like, oh, and you make commission. And I was like, 
what? I mean, <laughs> I'm with you. Like, I couldn't believe it. And then I got in and I was like, why don't these people work? I, I looked at the other loan officers. I'm like, you guys aren't going to work for this? You know there's no limit to what we can make, right? I was so confused because I'm like, how do you not just go learn? Like, I just picked up guidelines. My first six months in the business, every day I read guidelines. Every day, mm -hmm. every night, I would read them until my head hurt, and then I would go to bed, and I would start over the next day, and I'd read more guidelines. And my, the loan officers I was around, I was like, don't we learn? Like, isn't that what we do here? Nobody was learning. They had stopped their learning way early. And so I think that if we were to get another model and you keep your high producing originators and you keep doing great with them, because I really like those that have been in it a long time, and then you get the new people to kind of grow up underneath them. And you, I think the person that doesn't work in, the, in that model is the one that just kind of doesn't do a lot of loans or just kind of hanging in there and costing the company money. But the economics will pencil if we stop catering to everybody and start having a, a much more strategic plan. Casey and I talked about that a little bit a few weeks ago when, when we spoke. Um, and I, I know she's been talking especially a little bit more about the management side of the industry, producing versus non-producing, um, and, and how you position yourself to manage expectations more effectively out of the gate, but also then how to make it pencil more effectively. Um, you know, with what we do in, in the strategic growth game, the recruiting game, we, we, you know, we see that a lot, right? Where you, you figure out how to move the needle a little bit to make the economics pencil out for a big producer, or even a, an above average producer. Um, what we've tried to do also is, is, is really get companies to think about whether or not those economics pencil out for the long term, right? Are, are we doing something to create stickiness with the value proposition that's going to support a retention play and not just a recruiting play? But I, I do think that goes back even to what you were talking about with, um, you know, why are we not looking for uh, um, a, a sort of a some global plan that will support bringing in new people out of the gate um, to, to be originators is that a lot of things have to maybe change for that to work. It's not just, it's not just one thing. I, I'm, I, I was thinking about you over the weekend. I was reading an excerpt from um, a, a podcast that I'll listen to at some point that had, um, gosh, I can't remember the guy's name. I think it's Kevin Kelly. He's a futurist that started Wired Magazine. I don't know if this wow. sounds familiar to you. It, really interesting guy that's been involved on the front end with some AI and robotic stuff, really smart guy. And when he turned 68, he put out these 68 items unsolicited to help people have a better life. And they're, it's kind of interesting. Um, yeah. and, but one of them was his belief that enthusiasm always trumps intelligence. And although he doesn't believe in IQ point, like he doesn't believe in IQ as a measurement of much of anything um, on its own, but that if there was, it would, it, would, it would count for about 25 IQ points. You strike me as the guy that has both though. And that's not normal in the sales world. Do you recognize that? I do. Yeah. And I, I there's certain things I've, I've learned growing up and actually, you know, living at 45 now. And I, I love how much you learn kind of later in life and you start to accept about yourself. I have accepted that about myself because it's what makes us successful in business is to have both the funny and the smart. Um, I'm willing to admit that that is true without coming across as having an ego or whatever, like that's what I do. I suck at so many things, but the thing I'm super good at is I research like crazy, I learn like crazy, and I have a good head on my shoulders, and I love humor. Like it's, I love being funny and having the charisma. Now, that doesn't work with a lot of people just because even, I know people that have that, but don't have the right support around them or don't have the people that can help them plug that in. Because without having, the, if I wouldn't have married my wife, for example, I mean, she's my grounding force. Like if I didn't marry her, I'd be, I don't I have no idea where I'd be because she is, I'm like all over here and she's like, boom. And so she'll always bring me back to make sure that it's guiding the right way. So yeah, I, I get that I have that. And fortunately for me, I've been surrounded by amazing people that have made that sing instead of made that uh, difficult. Um, well, and, and you've, you figured out a way to make something that I would assume could be wildly boring 
and make it entertaining so that the salespeople in the room that, you know, they, where's my cell phone? Well, I was polite enough to put it away and now I can't find it. But when you're in front of a group of people, you know, a lot of times they're on their phone, right? And they're probably dealing with loan level scenarios or a new lead that just came in and it's hard to keep their attention. Mm -hmm. Um, What you provide, they have to do. I mean, it's it's a requirement anyway. Um, But maybe that's why, because you're able to combine the two, you're able to create this content that makes something also pretty boring, (laughs) potentially. (laughs) Not, not so boring.